this. Let's remember what I read in uh, Psalm 40, because this is, if you'll notice on the board, this is Psalm class number 17, dealing with Psalm 40, part B. So last class was part A, all right? But um, instead of reiterating and, and uh, wasting time, I want to make sure that I'm able to cover certain things here. Por supuesto. Uh, so, so turn, if you would, to 1 Peter. And what we're going to do is we're going to continue this line um, that we were dealing with. Really, uh, you could call it a contrast between priests and judges. <clears throat> Not a negative contrast, but a contrast whereby we could, if nothing else, if we, let, let's just say it like this. If you are still having problems being identified in Christ crucified then you may fall into the need for a judge and a civil court, all right? Uh, but we're trying to show that the true line that the Lord was taking in Psalm 40 and uh, that he'll be taking here is in relationship to this priesthood. Let me just read here. What, so now in the New Testament, well, let me, let's read this first. Uh, it's uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And I do want to say the word royal there is actually not a good... Uh, many of your translations will probably not say it like that. It'll probably say a kingdom of priests, okay? Because that's the proper translation. You're not going to be a king. You're going to be a kingdom of priests, okay? I know you've been taught that, but, uh, you know, you might be a ruler, but you're not going to be a king, all right? Um, not in the sense of what we think, okay? Uh, but, he, but let me just say this. Even if you were a king, this is talking about us being a kingdom of priests, okay? So you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people of his own, and of course that's a peculiar people, which refers strictly to the priests in the Old Testament. That's where that phrase came from. Uh, that you should bring forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, we were looking at the Old Testament pattern. We came out of, the, the, we came out of Egypt, and as soon as we got into the wilderness, judges got established. And as soon as that got established, everybody was dealing with issues and stuff. And then God set up the priesthood. Okay, so he got it back to what he wanted. Jethro had his plan, but God has his plan, all right? And so then uh, uh, the judges started. Okay, now here's, here's the A number one question. Why did the period of the judges start? What precipitated it? Yeah, but there, there's, there's a, another more specific... The death of Joshua. And that's in like the first two verses, I think, of, of Judges 1. The death, of, okay, well, what is Joshua? How's that translated in the New Testament, the word name? Jesus. It's as if he was died and put away, and they started just dealing with issues. And they lost, because, as, because why? Because as long as Joshua was leading them, there was victory. They were taking the land, which is what? They were finding the habitation of God. They were finding themselves as his habitation. They were entering into all the fullness. Everything was going good. When he's out of the picture, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Okay? And that gets hard for judges to... <laughs> to make a good decision because everybody's just doing what's right in their own eyes. Well, I'm right. I'm taking you to court because I'm right. Okay? <clears throat> um, but now in the New Testament, you are a royal priesthood. Everything is set back to default. Everything that got off, all of the spyware, all of the viruses, wiped out and everything goes back to default. Okay? <clears throat> now we are priests and it's a kingdom of priests and on that basis does this priesthood on, on what basis does this priesthood operate it operates on the same as the old testament except 
that now the self-giving one is our life. The sacrifice, the high priest lives in us. Okay? That's, that's the difference. So let's view this priestly basis compared to the people's method of civil court. Let's, let's look at this. We're uh, still in uh, 1 Peter. Let's look. We're still in the second chapter. Let's just start at verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the perverse or forward, whatever translation you have, to those that are perverse, to those that are off, to those that are bad, to those that are mean. Um, so let me read my statement now. Servants, be subject to the good master. But if an unjust or perverse one comes along, take them to court. <laughs> it don't say that. <laughs> that ain't right. It didn't say that. It said be subject to them no matter what the condition as a priest because that verse came before all of this as one who sacrifices, as one who offers up sacrifice to God, as one who is continually offering up Christ. That's what a priest does. He continually offers the lamb. All through the Old Testament, that's what he did. We're offering the lamb of God in spirit, continually, okay? <clears throat> Verse 19, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. This is, this is, he's saying basically this is good. This is the very situation that would call for a civil court. But it is considered to be an admirable thing to actually endure grief rather than to get out of it on the basis of a judge and civil court. Does anybody see that? Am I making that up? Is that not really, really? Because you, you, know, you would have every right to take that to civil court. If, you, if somebody's mistreating you, are you listening to me? I'm not taking away any rights. You have every right under that exact same situation. There's only one difference. He's addressing priests in this second chapter. Can I get amen? That's what he started with, verse 9. We're, we just, we're down to 18 verses, and trust me, it's all in the verses before this, too. I just didn't know we weren't going to have enough time to deal with all of them. Okay? <clears throat> so he's saying... It's actually commendable to endure grief. All right, let's consider the word endure. What's another good word for that? Put up with, go through, uh, all right, I, I will never forget when the Lord spoke to me at a certain juncture in my life and he said, you know where the scriptures say, Jesus, or the, you know, that I'm a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief? And the place I was at at that point, he said, this is what I'm acquainted with, what you're going through right now. And I felt it deeper than I can ever tell you of being, you know, suffering wrongfully and uh, being put through stuff and yet Jesus said I'm, I'm a man of that long as I'm on the earth I'm a lamb on this earth that's being offered up not in a glorious way okay all right so verse uh, 20 for what glory is it for what what glory is it if, when you're buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if, when you do well and suffer for it, and you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Okay, so, if, notice, I want you to notice the words glory. How many of you want to bring glory to God? Careful. Careful. You might be raising your hand over a misconception of what that means because we just read what method will bring him glory. All right? 
If our goal is truly to get glory for God, then we must find and adhere to that means that gives him glory and not give it up to justify ourselves in civil court. All right. Can we do that without being kicked out of the family of God? Can, can we give that up? Can we give up uh, this, can we give up not giving God glory in the situation and take it to a civil court and, and still be in the family of God? Yes. yes. I would even say, does he love you less? No, he doesn't. But he doesn't get as much glory. And a priest, his heart is so for the Lord that all he can think about is, if this is what gives you glory, then I must not just believe this principle, this method. I, not everyone else, I must adhere to it because I want you to have glory, all right? <clears throat> so, but notice it said acceptable to God. Now let's remember, the New Testament is the fulfillment of the old. It's not just a new thing God did, it's the fulfillment of something so the acceptable sacrifices in the Old Testament, there was only one. It was a lamb that was without blemish. There's the only acceptable. Any lamb that had blemish, anyone that tried to offer itself that was blemished, blemished the whole thing. Can I get amen? amen. When it's, anytime you see this is acceptable, it's a direct pointing to Christ and him crucified. It has to be because it's the only thing that was accepted on behalf of all the people. That's why when Jesus showed up, they said, Behold the Lamb of God. They didn't say, Behold the new guy that's bringing in a new religion. They said, He's the fulfillment of this. Okay? And um, so, the, the acceptable to God is the acceptable sacrifice and the only. God never accepted not one person that went to Him unless they had a lamb and offered it and they were accepted on behalf of the lamb or we call it accepted in the beloved, in union, in union, like a branch to a vine. We're only accepted because we're one with Christ and God sees his son. Uh, yes? So the acceptance that God through Christ happens only in that. Yeah, we'll get, into, we'll get into some of that, yes. Amazingly, we find in these scriptures that to do well, get this sentence, that to do well is not the thing that pleases God. Amen. <laughs> that's good. I love that response, Susan. That's the right response because that's our minds. We have been trained in religion that just doing the right thing is what brings glory to God. Have we not? Yeah. Now, folks, remember what we said, uh, you know, earlier about the scriptures and we must adhere to what, what the, this is what is the scripture. And what is that scripture saying? It is saying, well, let me make sure that I've, I've, you know. Amazingly, we find that in these scriptures that to do well is not the thing that brings glory to God. Most Christians adhere to this method for bringing glory to God, meaning everything they do, they try to do things well. They try to get God glory by doing the right thing. Am I right or wrong? Okay. But the method for glory described here is to do well and yet to suffer as a criminal while taking it patiently. This is bringing glory to God. I'm, t I'm asking you, <laughs> is this Randy's doctrine or did I stumble into something that was written 2,000 years ago that apparently not a lot of people are reading their Bible because that's pretty clear to me, you know. We would say, the very reason why I need civil court is I did everything right. The very reason why I need God to bring judgment or vengeance or avenge me in this situation is because I did everything right. I am a Christian. I do it right. And we would say, yeah, and so we'd say, this ain't bringing glory to God that you're doing this to me when this says it is bringing glory to God if you'll take it patiently, endure grief, and suffer wrongfully. My Lord, we need to revamp Christianity. 
We need to line it up with Christ and him crucified. Paul's the one who said, God forbid that I know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. We know everything. He didn't say, yeah, never mind. Yeah. So wouldn't it matter concerning the, the cause? I mean, like, wrongfully for Christ's sake, okay, other than being accused of stealing something, and then you go to get him, and you get, you go to jail for it anyway, or whatever you found guilty of it. Well, we'll get into... Well, I would say maybe to some degree, except the, the examples that I didn't get into uh, just before this, but I only mentioned verse 18 so that we could follow that, that passage, is that if, if a servant, a regular old servant, that is a Christian, that is a priest, has a master, because remember, they were slaves. If they had a master that was mean and abusive, he said, th this is what he's talking about. This is, this is following that line. You, you go, it doesn't even say, well, if he's beating you up just because you're a Christian. You know, it is this spirit of Christ that, that suffered the, the, the just for the unjust. It's a spirit. It's the way that he is. It's not an issue. See, the hard part of this is until we see Jesus in this manner, it's not an issue-based process. It is, it is a sacrificial-based process. If you're a... And it is, that's exactly right. And he will be that way. He cannot help but be that way. The rub comes with us, and so God says, look, there, there's, you know, you people are keeping my man up. He can't even go into the tabernacle. He can't even talk to me because from evening... Uh, from morning to evening, y'all are coming to him with his issues, so let's set something up for the people. But God didn't, I don't think God snuck out, you know, he's in the Shekinah glory, and he goes, I'm going to sneak out of the tabernacle and go see how this judge thing's going. He was involved with the priests. That was his family. Did you have a something, comment? <laughs> right, right, good point, right, the ungodly, very good point, all right, so, <clears throat> pardon, yeah, and I'll get in, I, I will get into that, because this does relate to everything that is coming, and not just what we're into right now, and that's where we miss it because we're living for the now instead of we have his eternal, his eternal perspective. All right, so verse uh, 21. Uh, for even hereunto were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. All right. This method for bringing God glory is not something that you do from time to time within your calling. It is your calling. For hereunto are you called. Amen. We think in terms of our calling. That's verse 21. We think in terms of our calling, and then within the carrying out of that, there's going to be um, um, things that go wrong. And when we're in things that go wrong, this is when I move into this mode. Uh, but for the most part, this is detached from me and my calling. This says this is your calling. It's not something you do sometimes within the midst of your calling. It is your calling. And we'll see that in relationship to this thing about being an example. One reason why Christ suffered for us, for us who? The guilty. There is no question we're guilty, and he's not. He suffered for the guilty. He, he suffered for the perverse. He suffered for the wrongdoer. He suffered for the oppressor. He suffered for all the ones he's saying you suffer for. One reason Christ suffered for us, the guilty, was so we could grab hold of this as an example by which we also live our lives. If you'll notice this whole example thing, he's not saying it's so, an, so you can see an example of, of a good teacher. 
or a good this or that. He's saying Jesus suffered just like what you're going through, and he lived for God. And, I, and, and one reason why I let my son do that I mean, forget all the other reasons you think Jesus died. He's saying right here, one reason is I wanted you to see an example of this because this is your calling. All right, so um, one reason Christ suffered for us was so we could grab hold of this as an example by which we also live our lives. What is presented as an event from the life of Christ is presented to us as a calling and lifestyle example. Now, I, I, I want to make that clear. It looks like, it's, it's not, but it looks like God has settled on, if you have this long line, this long line of the life of Christ, and here he was born, you know, or maybe just let's start at his ministry, starts his ministry, three and a half years later it ends. And down here at the very end, there's this part where he suffered wrongfully and he did this and that. And it looks like God is pulling out one little saying pattern your whole life after that part right there doesn't it well I don't know where you're from but I'm from Old Cliff and the thought that comes to the mind of somebody from Old Cliff is dude you went through that for three days you know whatever however days here and you're telling me I'm supposed to put up with this my whole life I would say I if that old cliff fella is not a priest. He's probably one of the people of God, and that's okay, but he doesn't understand that at all. Several things to comprehend. First of all, God set the cross and all that happened to Jesus as an example of eternal life. Self-giving. Okay? A life of self-sacrifice. To this degree, even. So I would say, being from Oak Cliff, why do I have to live, you know, 60, you know, when is my trial going to end over this like yours did? But he's saying, you know, in the modern vernacular, look, dude, <laughs> what I did with my son, this is his life. That is the highest point where you could see what he's really like. He always laid down his life. He took it from them. He laid down his life here. He did this and that. You know, somebody came to me not too long ago, and they said, yeah, but you know, I mean, Jesus drove out the money changers, and he rebuked the Pharisees. You know, I can, if I took you through the Bible and showed you how many times where laying down your life was the thing that was the deal, and you pull out two things that refute the rest of the Bible, I mean, something's wrong with that. Something is wrong with that, okay? God is saying, he's saying this little phase right here called the cross. You pattern your whole life in calling after that. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that at that point Jesus took up his soul right. and took it, whoa dude, <laughs> took it up for himself and, and that he was living by his own volition, by his own zeal for some reason and that he wasn't still living by the life of the other, that he wasn't living that cross and that life that was poured out. He was still living by the life of his father. He didn't ever violate that just because it looks different to our stupid eyes. Right, right. Amen. Well, I can even answer those. But, you know, here's, here's what I've discovered after so many years. You know, I've got a lot of answers, and I've got a lot of ways to, talk, you know, to say back to people. I could, I could you know, what, what I call sword fight. They're, they've got the scriptures, and I've got the scriptures, and we're sword fight. I can sword fight with people. But, folks, I didn't get this except the Holy Spirit showed it to me, and they're not going to get it either. And I'll tell you another thing. Paul resisted this, and I resisted it. And I resisted it. Uh, Y'all don't know my history. I resisted this reality, and I resisted it hard. And my father brought me into it by his glorious grace because it is the son. It's not about the son. And this section right here, Paul.
Paul continually says, I, God forbid that I glory in anything but the cross. God forget, bid, get, forbid that I know anything among you, save Christ and him crucified. He always focused right here. The whole of all eternity, of all time, the fullness of time is right here. Everything comes right there. But no, 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 we just, we want to make that just another little part of the whole thing. And it's not. It's not. Well, let's finish this because I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got, I've got to finish this tonight, okay? <clears throat> um, I just want to read that again because it means so much. One reason Christ suffered for us was so we could grab hold of this as an example by which we also live our lives. What is presented as an event from the life of Christ is presented to us as a calling and lifestyle example. In verse 22, let's read it. Um, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. The example to follow is that of one, speaking of Jesus, who is the one, of one who also did nothing amiss. Because he said, suffer wrongfully, take it patiently, this is thankworthy. Is that right? When it says there, that uh, in verse 22, who did no sin, folks, that's not talking about the sinless Christ. That's talking about the fact that he didn't do anything wrong either. Okay? And yet, though he did no wrong, there was no guile. He didn't try to get back at him or something. Um, so let me read that again. The example to follow. The example to follow is... is of one who did nothing amiss yet suffered for it. In fact, he is more pure than we are. I mean, no sin, okay? Notice the word, no. <laughs> but was still falsely accused and condemned. Okay. The righteousness side of us says, I have done nothing wrong. This is wrong. This is unjust. I have not sinned. The sacrifice side of Jesus says, of course I haven't done any sin and I'm being offered up. It had to be a lamb without spot or blemish. Amen. Our minds are over here in being the people of God, getting a hold of one of the judges of God to, to iron out the issues of man. His mind, and it does say, let this mind be in you, and the mind it describes is this self-giving mind, folks. It isn't this, if anybody had a right to be, you know, a sense of injustice, or, you know, my, my God, he never sinned, ever. He, you know, and yet, this is, I mean, I'm going to tell you, this blows my mind, okay, because I understand a sense of injustice. Let me tell you, this is no easy thing for me to preach here, all right? My flesh wrestles just as much as yours does. The question isn't, you know, how good I'm doing. The question is, is that the word of God? Right. What blows my mind is that Jesus is pure, righteous. He is he's never in heaven. I bet, you know, I mean, all the angels worship him, everything. There's never been a sense of injustice. He gets down here and everything's injustice. But something overrode his sense of injustice. Something was higher, folks. It's like the, you know, gravity pulling you down or the law of aerodynamics that shoots you up into space until you break gravity and you're in the heavens. What was that law? That law was the law of the Lamb, the law of self-giving, the law of love. Uh, of love. The law of sacrifice, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And, and, and I, I wish I could make this more plain, that I can see this at work in Jesus. I can see the one who is pure justice and pure right going, uh, uh, you know, he did. Father, let this cup pass from me. He, he struggled with it. But something kicked in, and where did he end up going? Yeah, he didn't go back in the pilot and say, look, dude, this ain't right. These, false these are false accusations, I'm telling you, and I'll prove it. I 
I will call 10,000 angels, and they will whoop your butt. Excuse my French. Sure, sure he could have. Sure he could have. <clears throat> All right. If, if I say any of this with any kind of oomph, God being my witness, I am a man of frailties and lack, but I have seen that this, 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 this is it. That's what the scriptures are saying, and my life's supposed to line up with that. <clears throat> All right. So, but not being at fault, but taking it patiently is not enough. Okay. I'm not at fault. I'm taking it patiently. It's still not enough. Scriptures say to fully bring God glory in the situation requires that there be no guile in our mouth. Because, you know, we can... We can take it patiently, not answer back, not fight back, and go tell somebody and go, well, you know, they ain't right. They, them people ain't right. You know, and still have guile in our mouth. To fully bring God glory in the situation requires there be no guile in our mouth. The lamb had nothing in his mouth. He was not only guileless, but completely silent. Verse 23 Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Oh, aren't you, aren't you glad to get to this verse? Aren't you glad? Committed himself to him that judges righteously. Oh, this is going to just change the direction of everything now. No, it's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's see, that's verse 23, is that what I read? Yeah. <clears throat> what, has been called, what has been called for so far is completely out of the range of what a civil court would call for. Do you agree with that? that you'd never ask them to be silent or to take it patiently. I'm telling you, civil court would, this is not civil court. Let's settle that right now. This is not civil court. Let's get that settled, all right? <clears throat> um, the civil court method might justify us in the eyes of all men and make the other person look bad. But who is most glorified by that? Not if we are. If, if, we, if, if they make them look bad and us look good, we're the one who's going to be the most glorified. And that's exactly what a civil court will do. The true test found in Peter's method for bringing glory to God involves how well the mouth does. But the last part of this verse shows that we are not helpless victims. Amen. We have committed ourselves to him that judges righteously. We have brought the case to civil court, right? Uh, we uh, threaten, but have committed himself to him that judges righteously. We have uh, brought it to civil court. Vengeance or being avenged does not mean to get back Get them back for what they did to you. Okay, let's, let's just consider that. If our mentality is that vengeance or God getting them is simply getting them back for what they did to us, that's called an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I got news for you. That's called the old covenant. Okay, I mean, let's just, you know. It's not getting them back. Uh, it's putting it in the hands of him that judges righteously, and we don't even know what that is. We're not righteous, okay? Um, having a hearing is when we present our case to God and he hears it. <laughs> well, we've got to have a hearing over this, you know? We've got to go to court, we've got to have a hearing. Well, your hearing is when you pray and you give it to him. He goes, I heard that, okay? That's your hearing. <clears throat> um, we bring the case to him because only he judges righteously. Our views are usually distorted in favor of ourselves. Okay? So I, I'm going to tell you, maybe you're better at it than me. I have no ability to judge righteously. In my prayers, I regularly have to say, okay, even recently I prayed something. You know, 
was like maybe a couple of years ago, actually, I prayed something, and I noticed the fulfillment of it happening in my life where God was opening the scriptures and particularly the Old Testament and particularly the tabernacle and all this, and I'd ask him to do that. I asked my father to do that. And I noticed, he's just doing incredible, I mean, I'm in the Word, and I just went, I put down my Bible, and I said, Lord, don't let this be a Hezekiah thing. Remember when Hezekiah was told, you got, you know, a short time, you're going to die, and he prayed, God, let me live 15 more years, and God gave him his request, because he was his son, and in that 15 years, a horrible king named Manasseh was born, his son, that turned everything that he did in a horrible, horrible way, and I said, Lord, you know what, I ask you that, and I ask you as my father, and you've done it, and you've done it mercifully, but Lord, totally stop doing that right now if somehow this is going to lead to something that brings me glory, that doesn't truly honor you, that ends up getting off somehow or another. God, shut it down because I don't, I don't just want this. I want it if it's going to bring you glory. And you know how our Father is. He'll do that. You know, if that's the case, thank God, thank God. And um, so I, I'm saying, I don't, I don't trust myself. I don't trust my prayer. I, I, I always add, you know, thy will be done, you know. My God, the, the, the thought that my will be done scares me to death for you. <laughs> and that's, that's the truth. It does. You know, I approach this in fear and trembling, and it may not appear that way, but I'm telling you, I do my best. And, you know, you know, even in that, I know that there's, there's fault. Okay, however, if our view of having our day in court involves airing our complaints to the evildoer and standing up to them for our rights, then we're blinded to the priesthood and sacrifice to which we are called. We must be one of God's people, oh, therefore we must be one of God's people and not one of his priests. That's not a bad thing. It's just something that must be recognized for what it is. And that's okay. If we are a victim, then don't be abused. If you're, the balance of the thing that I feel I saw isn't that, you know, that you have both of these working together. The balance is if they're the people of God, they need judges. And if they're the priests of God, they need sacrifice. Yes. Yeah, it's very, it's very similar. And should I get into Hebrews 10 out of Psalm 40, like when I get back, um, I'll probably deal with that. It's, it's really, really incredible. It's really, really, Hebrews 10 in light of Psalm 40 is pretty incredible. Um, <clears throat> that's it. Uh, we must be, okay, in verse 18, okay, so verse, let's reread verse, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the perverse. Um, in verse 18, you are expected to stay subject to the perverse master until God deals with the situation as, a, as one of the people of God, as a, peop, as a people of God. You are expected to stay under subjection until God deals with the situation. You endure grief and you suffer being wrong. Oh, wait a minute. However, if you're a priest, you go further and bring glory to God in the situation. That's what it's calling for. Amen. You endure grief and you suffer being wrong and you do it all patiently. What are you patiently waiting for? Your chance to speak up and to prove you've been wrong? No. Your chance to revile and accuse back? No. We are given only one example of what our day in court looks like, Jesus during his trial and crucifixion. It is an eternal example. No other example will fulfill the picture as this one does. This scripture is saying, for even here unto we call, because Christ also suffered for us, da -da -da -da, who did no sin, and guile fountain, didn't revile about all this stuff, but committed, folks, it says he committed himself to him that judges righteously. Okay. So let's let's look at the verdict of the judge. Here's Jesus. He stands before the court of God, angels and demons and everything else looking. He stands before Pilate and, and uh, Herod and everyone else being accused. 
He commits himself to him that judges righteously because there was no God. There was no uh, uh, sin. There, he, he, he's being blamed wrongfully. Folks, what is the verdict? Guilty, you die for it on the cross. God didn't say, that's it. He's right. He's the best, he's the rightest thing ever been on this earth. You people are slime balls. All of you die. <laughs> Jesus, the only one standing there, you know, chains fall off, and he goes, I told you I was righteous. <laughs> no, sir. No, he judges righteously. We don't know what that means. And Jesus goes to the cross for all of the wrongs of everybody that's accusing wrongfully and everybody that's doing and he dies for them okay <clears throat> I say that because I'm saying the day in court that is described where the judge judges righteously only gave us one example it is an eternal example it is Jesus during his trial and crucifixion. It could have gone anywhere with this. Are you following me? This is that this crawl, this time period, that's God's picture. That's God's judgment. You're a sacrifice, Jesus. And Jesus didn't go, no, no, no. If he was just a victim, if he was just one of the people of God and said, no, I want out, God said. God hath given me a commandment that I can take my life or lay it down. Did you know that that's a scripture? He said, God hath given me a command that I can, I can take up my life or lay it down. I, can, I don't have to die. And guess what? Listen to me. You don't have to die either. Amen. You can make a civil court out of this and go to court, and God will deal with it in a whole nother vein. He won't deal with you as a sacrifice. And I would say to you, don't get into this situation if you're not a priest, if you don't understand this spirit. If it's not, don't do it. Stay in civil court. You'll be there from morning to evening because there will always be issues. But nonetheless, the balance of this is give some people freedom. If they don't have it, they don't have it. I'm not going to beat them with it. But it doesn't change the truth. And it doesn't change the eternal example and it doesn't change that that's not only his verbal example. He says, this is how you ordered your calling. Okay? Um, so, previously in verse 21, so let me read 24. Even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. So, previously, verse 21, let us know that those who follow Jesus, follow, anybody ever heard the term, follow Jesus? Those who follow Jesus, regardless of denominational or theological stance, must follow him in these steps also. Because it says, I mean, didn't, didn't, am I making that up? Can you recall leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps? What steps? Well, I'm not going to go over it again. Those are clear there. Brought out also by verse 21 was the reason why Christ suffered for us. It was so we could see an example of what following Jesus entails. Amen. This is what following Jesus is. But now let's go to verse 24 because it's going to give us another reason why he died. Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live under righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Verse 24 gives us a second reason why Jesus died for us. It is, that, it is that we, he died for us, that we should live under righteousness and that we might find healing. Amen. Healing. Okay, do you agree with that? I, I believe that he died, let's just put it in a simpler term, he died to free us. Okay, the first the, these scriptures give two reasons why he died for us. The first reason was so we could see the example of how he lived and apply it to ourselves. The second is so that he died so that we could be free. All right. So um, while this is wonderful, many times we miss the method. We're going to get something out of it, but we miss the method that he is trying to show us and only latch on to the benefit. 
Now the benefit is there, and I have no qualms with that. What does it say in one of the Psalms? Forget not all of his benefits. By stripes you were healed, da da da, da. It's, a, it's a quote here. These are benefits, but in the context here, he's trying to show you the method by which he did something and what he brought about with that method. So Peter is basically saying this, life comes out of death. That's, I mean, that's really, that's his point. It's not that we're righteous or that we have healing. It's the method by which we got it is that he's what he's trying to bring out here, okay? And that method was life comes out of death, okay? Um, so, uh, let's see. All things that Jesus suffered and went through were not in vain, but had specific purpose. Everything Jesus went through had a purpose. Okay, now let me ask you this. Does everything you go through have an eternal purpose behind it? <laughs> That's right. Uh, Jesus believed that this suffering and death that he went through would be God's chosen method for bringing life to others. Do you agree with that? Okay. Okay, we can agree with that on some sort of a, a theological basis when we draw a cross and we say Jesus died there so we can have life. He's not teaching us that. He's teaching us this is the method he did for you, and this is now your method. That's what this is all about. Um, no other way would do. For Jesus, all that he went through from birth to the cross in terms of suffering and loss was that those who were unjust, perverse, revilers, false accusers, and that make others suffer wrongly might find life. The very ones that you would take to court <laughs> Jesus lays down his life for. Why? 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 Several reasons. One is he's a living sacrifice. He's a self-giving person. Okay, well that's understood. What's the other reason? Because he knows that this cross method is the only thing that'll do it. There's nothing, you know, Jesus could come down here, white as snow, clean, godly nature and everything, and be around this guy who is rank on the inside because he's a fallen sinner, right? He's, he's born in sin. He can't do anything but go that way. And him too. And, he, and wait a minute, everybody around, oh no, everybody on the whole planet. So he can heal them, but they're still rank on the inside, right? They don't have life. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life. Yeah. You, you know, they go, oh, we need healing. We need bread. Do a miracle. Well, you know, you could do a miracle for them and feed them all. You know, then you got a bunch of fat atoms. You know? You know, you got, or, or worse, content atoms. <laughs> and so you got all these people. They're not changed on the inside. They're not, no, there is no, you heal their body. They're still after their same kind, even if, even if they look to the, the right God. Jehovah was the correct God. We believe in the right, they believed in the right God, but they were corrupt on the inside. Everybody needed not help, they needed life. And, and the method, and this must be understood, because we'll say the cross, but when we look at that cross, or when we consider the concept, we must say in our minds, that represents a principle, not two pieces of wood. What is the principle? Life comes out of death. Life comes out of death. Okay? Except the seed, one seed, one godly seed, die, falls into the ground and dies on that cross. If it doesn't do that, it'll be just one godly seed. If it dies, like that seed in the ground, all of a sudden it brings forth and there's more fruit after its kind, but it's all off the same stalk, the original. It all came from the original. All right. So it's just important. It's important because here's why I say that. I mean, you know, I remember years ago when I didn't fully comprehend this thing of life out of death. I, under, I understood basically the benefit to me. If Jesus died, here, here was the concept. If Jesus died, somehow I got life and whoopee. Okay. 
And, you know, I mean, a lot of Christians, that's pretty much their concept, you know. And so the Lord, the Holy Spirit started coming to me and he started saying, you know, started working on me. I want you to understand the principle of what was working in Jesus because you're going to be united to him. You're going to live as one with him. You're going to, you know, you're going to function by him, not just for him. And how can you do that if you don't understand the principle of his own life? Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, there are times I don't like this principle. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm being honest with you. The, and here's why. Because there are people sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I get so upset with, I wish God would just fry them where they are. You know, I mean, you folks ought to thank God every day that I'm not God. Amen. You know. But Jesus, Jesus, I would look at Jesus and Jesus would go, you know, it, it would be like I would come to the judge, and this is because he was making a son of God out of me, not because he wasn't treating me fair. I would come to the judge and I would say, Lord, look at that. Look what they did and everything. And, and uh, you know, all this stuff and it's not fair. And, da -da -da -da. and he'd say, well, it's like he, you know, Jesus was a man of few words much of the time. He said, um, well, I'd just die for him. And, of course, you go, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you know, that's not what I'm in here for, Lord. You know, that's good. That's good. And I remember saying stuff like this. I said stuff like this. Yeah, but you're the son of God. And he said, well, who do you think you are? Meaning, I'm the son of God, too. That's what he said to me. Who do you think you are? I went, would you stop? I mean, it was like, you can't argue, you can't argue with the guy. He's, he's good. You know? Golly. And I didn't, un I, honestly, I'm telling you, my mind didn't understand because clearly this, this situation was unfair. Clearly they... These people deserve something really bad and all this kind of stuff. And, he, you know, it's almost like, I know what you're going to say. You know, you go in there later on. I know what you're going to say. You die for them. You, you just die for them. Well, I'm here to get justice. Well, in my case, and this is the honest truth, in my case, he wouldn't let me up because he had something else in mind and he wanted me to follow this priesthood path. He wanted me to follow this life of giving sacrifice. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, so I'll read that last sentence. For Jesus, for, for Jesus, all that he went through from birth to the cross in terms of suffering and loss was that those who were unjust to him or unjust, perverse to him or just perverse, revilers of him on the cross, or just revilers. Um, I read a scripture the other day that just blessed me. It's, it's in the Old Testament. He says, if a, if a husband or father makes a vow, he shall keep that vow. And you, you let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, and, and you better stick with it, or you will suffer for it. He says, however, if a wife or daughter who lives in the home makes that vow and the husband or father deems that that's not a good thing that you did, he can nullify that and she will not be punished. And I saw, yeah, <laughs> and I saw this is, this is, this is the bride of Christ. I mean, this is, uh, this is how he treats us. Even on the cross, he was treating us that way. Because he's up there and he's hanging on the cross. And folks, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Come on. You know, if I, you better thank God I wasn't hanging on the other cross. I would turn to Jesus and go, come on. Those people are rank, r dirty dog. You know, I mean, they, they, I would do this, you know rip my hand out of the go, they know what they're doing. That's exactly right. And he, and he said, 
He said, because it says in that, in that vow thing, if they don't know, they, because they really don't know. They don't see. They don't, it's like they don't know. And Jesus is going, I nullify all of what they did to me. Father, forgive them. They don't know. God. Records clear? Now the Holy Spirit can deal with you on a clean slate. Will you come to Jesus? You understand what I'm saying? You don't, you're not carrying baggage. You're just, I mean, that's pretty amazing. Again, this is wonderful about Jesus. The sad thing is we don't realize that this is the example given to us whereby we are to live. All right, so, um, so he, he did this for revilers and false accusers that make others suffer wrongly that they might find life. They could never gain it in themselves, and that's a fact. These revilers, these, they can, clearly they're messed up. You know, we say they're messed up. Right? We say, they're messed up. You know? It's like, it's, it's like going to the great physician, Jesus himself, and pointing to somebody and saying, they're messed up. And he goes, you know, yeah, they're messed up. That's why I'm here. I'm a physician to help them. You know? You're not messed up. You know, of course, with my usual response, oh, I'm messed up. Because <laughs> I want you to get, you know. <clears throat> This spirit must be at work in us. It's called Christ in us, but it's not just some fairy tale thing. It's very specific. All right, so, um, therefore, the Holy Son of God, notice the words, his own self, that's verse 24, his own self uh, bore up under the avalanche of accusations and false, well, and lies and in a real and physical way, not just theologically, not just theoretically, him, his own self, it says, in his own body. It's trying to, do you see the point it's trying to make? It's trying to say, this isn't theory. He didn't live in theory, and the example he's given you, it ain't supposed to be theory for you either. All right? Um, not just theoretically, but in the person of his own body, gave us an example. But not only that, he did the same thing for us that he now asks of us. He did. How did we come in? Life out of death. Right? He did that for us. And then he does it for us, and then he turns around and he says, now, if there's any hope for these people, it's only going to be through this principle of life out of death. Okay? If you are just one of the people of God, you're not prepared. You're not ready. You're not suited yet. That's not a shame. That's not a slam. It's a fact. You need to go get justice from the judge. You need to take this to a civil court. Because why? Strictly and only for one reason. You're a victim. And victims have judges provided by God. Amen? Amen? Acknowledge it. Believe it. Use it. Appeal to it. But if you're not a victim, if you're a sacrifice, if you're a living sacrifice, if you're, uh, what, what is a... Uh, 1 John 3.16, 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16, 1 John 3.16. By this perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. There's your example, not just a, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay? That's, a, that's not theory. That's, that is something whereby we are releasing, because folks, when we lay down our lives for the brethren, when we're living sacrifices, that's Christ in us. There is nothing in you or me that is self-giving at all. We are selfish to the teeth. We are, we are, and we are. And, and I am, and I admit it, I, that's why I give you examples of things I think or say, but ultimately I come back to the life of Christ, and I say, not I, but Christ. Not I, that cross has got to be the center for me. You understand? Somebody says, well, that's wrong. You're out of balance. No, no, no. Within the priesthood, that's balanced. But if, you, if, you, if the priest walks out and says, all the camp will live this way, that's out of balance. 
And if the priest doesn't give recourse to victims, that's out of bounds. Amen? You, you can't just say, no, no, this is the only way. Well, you know, Jesus is the only way, yes. But when we're not letting him be the way, he's also the provider, Jehovah Jireh. And he'll provide a judge for you. Were you going to say something? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I will say that I've never done that intentionally. I've never done that oppressively. I mean, as, as much as I know, I've done it because I believe the truth of Christ and him crucified. But, the truth. Right. And, and I, but see, I, I, don't, I don't know that the Lord comes in and, and, you know, the only judgments that he gives for priests are judgments of life and death, judgments of, of you know, on that level. And I'm not trying to justify, I'm just saying, that's, that's just the facts. <clears throat> All right, so, again, uh, not only that, but he did the same thing for us that, that he now asks of us. We are those who benefited from this method, this life out of death method, but many will not believe in the method beyond what personally benefits them. All right, now, again, we ought... Did you hear 1 John 3, 16? We ought to lay down. It didn't mean we will. Did you hear me? We ought to. I believe we all ought to be priests. But folks, if you're not, if you're still a victim, not a living sacrifice, then you ought to, but not in a finger-pointing, mean, meanness way. You should go get recourse. From the civil court. <clears throat> All right, and finally, verse 25, and this is this is our wrap up. How much time we got left on that? Zero seconds. Okay. <gasps> For you were sheep going astray, but now are you returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Peter concludes with the fact that though we are sheep, people of God, we were not lambs, sacrifices, priests. Instead, we were the ones who were perverse. We were perverse masters, oppressors, etc. We were gone astray from the work of Christ, his death for us, and from the example of Christ, suffering wrongfully in faith and patience for others. But now we are returned to, to have our souls herded and shepherded back to the way of the Lamb. All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your spirit. May you make real everything that is true of your heart, despite me or, Lord, whatever... I have no desire, Lord, to put forth my doctrines, but, Lord, you constrain me. You come upon me. You, you open the word. You direct me what to share. Lord, I feel like a scribe over things like this, a, a, a transcriber, a secretary that you are just dictating to. And so, Lord, whether it be for us here or some later in the future or those who listen to this or watch a video, for those to whom it is truly life, may it be life. And to those, Lord, that don't get it or don't catch it, Lord, save them from condemnation. Save them from being an abused victim. Save them. You know I grew up in a home, Lord, where being an abused victim was commonplace for my mom and for my brothers and sisters. Father, you know that all within me is I have no desire simply to put people through stuff. I ask you to somehow close their ears to this. Somehow shield them from things that they are not yet ready for and let them be happy sheep and happy people of God who take advantage of all the provisions, who forget not none of your benefits. And Father, I just put it all in your hands. And I trust your precious heart and I pr trust your fathering guidance for each person. And I, I just thank you that I can rest in that, that you will care for each one where they're at. In Jesus' name.
Amen. All right, we're dismissed.